Well, good morning. Welcome to Northwest Bible Church and our continuing look at the second letter to the believers in the city of Seth Thessalonica. We've dubbed this a letter, Steadfast Christianity. And today we look at a unique um, exhortation that Paul gives to, at the end of this first chapter. And we're calling this Praying for Others a Must. Let me read just uh, verses 11 and 12. That's all we're going to deal with today. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for speaking to us directly from it. Um, thank you for this emphasis on the ministry of prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A major task of every talk like this, every sermon, is to move people out of the realm of passivity and into the realm of action. Sometimes it takes years to move some people. Uh, other times it's amazing how it can happen almost overnight. Sometimes, some people turn from spectator to participant in a matter of seconds. It reminds me of a story of a game warden named Luke, excuse me, Jake, and a fisherman named Sam. Jake was always amazed at how Sam would end up at the end of the day with a couple stringers full of fish while other anglers who were just as capable had trouble even catching two or three fish. This particular lake was loaded with fish but they seemed to elude the anglers on a regular basis. As a result there was no limit to the number of fish you could catch only the size and all of Sam's fish were big enough to bring home. The curiosity of the game warden finally got the best of him and he said to Sam on one occasion, Sam, I'd really like to know your secret. Sam, who was a man of very few words, responded, no problem, show up tomorrow morning at early and, and I'll show you. So the next morning, long before dawn, the game warden was there. Sam showed up. They got in the boat and Sam started the motor. 30 minutes later, they were out in a secluded part of the lake. It was important to Sam that no one else know his unique spot. They stopped. It was still as could be. Jake decided to sit back, fold his arms, and watch Sam do his thing. Sam reached down into his tackle box, pulled out a slender stick of dynamite, <laughs> lit it, tossed it in the air. About the time it hit the level of the lake, there was this enormous explosion. In a matter of seconds, fish of all sizes floated to the top of the lake, and without a word, Sam began to row his way over to pick up the largest fish in his net and then string him. Well, you can imagine the game warden screaming, wait, you, you can't do that. You're breaking every rule. I'm going to throw the book at you. You're going to pay for, for this. The fines are going to be huge. I'm going to stick you in jail. Sam looked at the game warden Jake and reached in his tackle box, pulled out another slender stick of dynamite, lit it, tossed it in Jake's lap, and said, you gonna sit there watching all day? You gonna fish. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how you can move from spectator to participant in a brief period of time. If there was any way for me to drop a stick of dynamite in your lap today to get you involved as I believe you should be and could be in the area of prayer, I would light the fuse in a second. 
The tragedy is that with any talk on the subject of prayer, it tends to remain in the theoretical. And it isn't that we don't believe in it. There wouldn't be a person in church. Even if you stop listening now, there isn't a person that listens to this that, that doesn't believe in prayer. Prayer is as much part of the Christian life as breathing is to the physical life. But somehow getting the print off the page and into the mixture of our experience on a daily basis is almost impossible. I don't think I know a Christian, myself included, that is rightly proud of their prayer life. Even though I may admire others in the family of God who I would consider to be prayer warriors, and I consider them to be a godly person, if you ask them, I, they're not satisfied with their prayer life. Most of us, I think, would confess that we know what the Bible says about prayer, but what we do about it, oh, that's where there's a world of difference. It's not so much that we don't believe about prayer, it's that we don't do it. My desire to, this morning is not to increase your guilt. Um, I, I've never known any lasting benefit from being the tool of Satan that increases people's guilt. My desire is to help you know what awaits you and the dynamic power that you can tap into, the sphere of influence you can have in the realm of prayer. And all it takes is you tapping into it. Some of us are growing old long before our years. Some have become wrinkled over the years because of worry and anxiety. And, and we are busy complicating God's work because we won't willingly take our hands off and leave it to Him in prayer. And, and, and I know you, you, you say you let God work. You say that you wait patiently for God to act. But do you? My desire after this talk is for a few people to get not just more informed about prayer, but more engaged in it. Not simply folding their arms and watching others do it. So let me start with a definition. What is it? If we say that prayer is an invaluable discipline, and it is a discipline, and it isn't valuable, what is it? Let me give you a definition. And I'll, I'll say it a couple times so you can write it down. I don't have it on the screen for you, but prayer is making deliberate contact with God in word or in thought. That's what it is. Prayer is making deliberate contact I'd underline that deliberate contact with God in word or in thought. It's not yawning, thinking or saying, oh, I hope God is involved in this or take over Lord or something casual. No, it is a deliberate connection. Lord, this is the need or Lord, you are the object of this moment or Lord, this is where I am. I can't handle this. You must step in and handle this. I'm taking my hands off. We deliberately choose to address the sovereign Lord God of the universe in a situation. And I've made a list of things, the ways that we do that. We express praise. We confess our wrongs. We request help. That's called petitions in Philippians chapter 4. We declare our need. We, we state our thanks. 
We also enter into someone else's world and pray on their behalf. I have a friend right now who is going to be going um, into surgery in the next hour or so uh, to have a stint put in his heart. He wasn't at church yesterday, and so um, I've been praying all morning for him that the Lord would guide the doctor in the, the, the delicacy of the surgery, um, that my friend would come out the other side uh, healthier. That's called intercession. And then the last one, which is my major focus today, Hebrews 14.6 says that we are to approach the throne of grace with confidence. James chapter 1 verse 5 says we pray to gain wisdom. Matthew 7.7-8 7 says in prayer we ask, we seek, we knock, and we find. In Philippians 4, 4 to 7, it says that in prayer we release the anxiety. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, after we've put on the whole armor of God, we are useless without prayer. Paul says that we are just simply a lot heavier and a lot more cumbersome if we don't add prayer to putting on the armor of God. Now, our, my interest this morning is a statement out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 that we looked at a number of weeks ago. You've, it's a three-word verse. You've probably quoted it a million times. It is simply the phrase, pray without ceasing. Now, that is a strange statement. How can we ever do that? Now, our Lord is a realistic God. Uh, he doesn't expect us to walk around each day with our eyes closed, spending 24 hours each day in constant verbal prayer. That's not what it means. I like the way one man wrote it. It doesn't mean that you should go into a monastery or walk around with your hands folded and your eyes closed all day. It means to live with Christ Jesus in such a way that you can talk with him and listen to him at any moment. How wonderful it is to be driving along the road, enjoying the scenery and say, Lord, thank you for making this so beautiful. And in the next sentence, you can be talking about a truck that just passed. My wife and I, he writes, do this all the time. We see sheep in the field and say, Lord, bless Miles and Jackie. A couple of our friends that we know raise sheep. If we know a good joke, we'll tell it and thank God for a good sense of humor and the gift of laughter. Sure, in the morning or evening, you have your eyes, you have your fixed time when you talk with the Lord and remember certain causes, but you can talk with the Lord all day about a host of things that come up because he is right there with you. That is what it means to pray without ceasing. It means to live with him every moment so that there's nothing between the soul and the Savior. That is really good. I know that was long, but that is really good. It is almost a, an atmosphere in which you mentally live in. Deliberate connection with God all the time because he is with you all the time someone asked a cleaning lady what was her method of prayer <laughs> she said I don't know about methods but I know lots about prayer when I pray I just do this I'm washing clothes and I pray Lord wash my heart clean when I iron later I pray Lord iron out all those troubles I can't do nothing about when I sweep the floor, I pray, Lord, sweep clean all the corners of my life. That is praying without ceasing. Now, <clears throat> some who are listening to this, uh, maybe students, you may have assignments and responsibilities and homework and reports that you have to write. And, and when I say students, I'm not talking about just middle schoolers and high schoolers. I'm talking about people in college or adults that have gone back to, to school like I did. Um, and your day can be literally filled with prayer without once closing your eye. 
I'll never forget the first time that I was, uh, I realized that you could pray without closing your eyes. Uh, we were on a family trip to California and just before we got to Disneyland for the first time, my, my dad uh, said we needed to pray and thank the Lord for the safety that we had experienced on the trip. And, and he started to pray. And, and I, I realized he was driving. And so I peeked, you know, I, I looked and I was thankful he was still watching the road. I learned a valuable lesson that day. It doesn't take a church. It doesn't take uh, bowing your head. It doesn't take you to be quiet. It, you can pray at any time, in any place, in any way, for any reason. We make deliberate contact with the living God by connecting him to my world. And regardless of the expression of your soul, he reads your thoughts, he knows them, and he understands. And I'm grateful it says without ceasing because it doesn't give us any out. It literally means incessantly or relentlessly. Someone paraphrased it, pray with the fervency of a hacking cough. If you have allergies or you get colds regularly like I do, you know that when you get stuffed up, you, you all of a sudden, part of the secondary symptoms of a cold or allergies is you start coughing. And sometimes you can't stop. That's what this word means. You get this little tickle in your throat and you can't get your word out without coughing, right? But why is it important? I think there's at least four reasons why prayer is important. And I draw these from about seven or eight New Testament passages. First, prayer refocuses my perspective. Without prayer, I only see two dimensions. I see prayer as the third dimension. Without prayer, I only see the visible. I only hear the audible. With prayer, I see the invisible. I hear the inaudible. Prayer refocuses my perspective. Secondly, prayer quiets my fears and calms my nerves. We have a pandemic of substance abuse in our country. And most of the time, the substance abuse is because we need something to calm our nerves. Our world seems out of control and difficulty is all around and there's things that we can't handle and so we medicate. I can remember going to prayer when I had a situation that was beyond my, my intelligence to even comprehend. And I remember going to prayer and, and saying to the Lord that I had no idea how to handle this. I had no idea the next move or what to do. I said, Lord, I need you to step in. And, and when I went to prayer, I was literally shaking. I was so worried and nervous. And when I said amen, there was this unexplainable calm that I hadn't experienced for, I'm sorry to say this, weeks, because I'd never taken it to the Lord in prayer. Every time that thought of that situation came up, I would just get overwhelmed. Prayer quiets my fears. It calms my nerves. That's a promise from Philippians chapter four. Thirdly, prayer transfers the burden. Prayer takes the load that I've been carrying, that I am not designed to carry, and it shifts it to the shoulders of the one who can handle the weight. It transfers the burden. Fourthly, prayer upholds others in need. That's what I want to talk about more today than anything else. Prayer takes the needs of other people and it pulls them away from my mind and my heart and it lifts them to the one who knows what's best. I don't know what's best. He does. And so when I go in prayer to God, 
On behalf of my friend or my family member or my coworker or my neighbor or whomever, and I uphold their needs in prayer, God is activated. Now, before we wind up in 2 Thessalonians, I'd like to us to look very quickly at Colossians chapter 4. Here is an intercessor, a man who we hear very little about. Matter of fact, I've only heard him referred to twice um, in, in my whole experience listening to sermons. And maybe you don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name. His name is Epaphras. And the Apostle Paul at the end of Colossians says, Epaphras, one who is of you, he was a part of that church in Colossae, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you always. And then what does Paul say about him? Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. Wow. Put the word intercession in the margin of your Bible. Intercession occurs when I labor earnestly for someone in prayer. Matter of fact, see, if you look at the word struggling, that is the original word agony, agonizomai. Epaphras always struggles in prayer for you. He goes into great labor and he takes on the burdens you are living with and he shifts the weight of those burdens to God in prayer. Now it's one thing to see that on the page about a man that we hardly know anything about. But my hope is that we become men and women just like Epaphras. Stop studying about prayer. Stop giving other people prayer requests. Get involved. Move from spectator to participant. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we find the Apostle Paul praying for these people, and it's obvious that he really loved them. You know, it's hard to pray for someone you don't care for. Matter of fact, I even had a coworker tell me when I made a comment about how much I appreciated him and his wife. He said, well, Scott, it's easy that to, to do work together, which they do 24 seven, because we start every morning praying together and praying for each other. And we do not turn out the light at night until we pray with each other and for each other. Paul's in Corinth. He's, he's busily engaged in the ministry with four other people in Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla, a husband and wife team, as well as Silas and Timothy. That's why he includes them in the very opening verses of this chapter. And he sends them this letter of love and he hears that some things have been happening and he, and he sends them this second letter and between the two, we have learned in the last couple of weeks that persecution really, the heat really got turned up. And so he tells them, verse 3 of chapter 1, that he thanks God for them, that he's proud of them, verse 4. And then finally, in verse 4, he prays for them. And before we analyze the prayer, look at the word constantly in verse 11. To this end, we constantly or always pray for you. Don't miss the consistency of that. I'd much rather a person prayed for me every day for two minutes than to set aside an hour to pray for me for a, for a month, once a month. I feel much better about one or two minutes a day than an hour a month. If, you've ra if you're raising children, pray for them every day. If your children are in their teen years or are young adults and they're out of your house and they're maybe even off married and they have their own children, 
Pray for your children every day. Pray for their spouse every day. There are three things that Paul prays for here in verse 11. Maybe, you have, maybe you've noticed them when we read it earlier. He says, to this end we pray for you that, here's the first thing, that God may make you worthy of his calling. That's the first. Second, that he may fulfill every resolve for good. And then third, every work of faith by his power. Now, when you read that, you think, huh, well, what's the big deal about those three? And, and a lot of times when we read our Bible, there, we read things on the surface and it seems rather obvious, but then when we start to dig deeper, we realize their significance. To this end, we always pray for you, consistency, that God may make you worthy of his calling. Let me put it in these words. I am praying that God's estimation, excuse me, I am praying that in God's estimation, you may live and act as those who have received such a high calling. What was their calling? Look back in verse 5. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Verse 11, to that end, we always pray for you that God may make you worthy of that calling. They are kingdom people. They are members of his body. They are his ambassadors, his representatives here on earth. And Paul prays that God will observe their suffering and in his estimation, they would be found worthy of that calling. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, For it has been granted to you for that for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. I mention that because most often we don't inform new Christians of this reality. God has called us to, yes, believe in him, absolutely. But he's also called us to suffer for him. We tend to leave the impression that if they just trust Jesus, that all or most all of their problems will be solved. The Bible doesn't teach that. Now, heretical Christianity teaches that. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel teaches that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. I've never met a Christian that had any kind of depth to their spiritual maturity that hadn't suffered. I've never met a Christian that is generous, that hasn't struggled. I've never met a Christian whose life really counted for Christ Jesus that didn't know hardship and affliction and misunderstanding and pain. Could it be that the fellowship of his sufferings that Paul mentions in chapter 1 is exactly what he's speaking of in chapter 3 when he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings? Paul prays for these believers that in God's estimation that they would be found worthy of that calling. I mean, are, are you impressed that he doesn't pray that their pain will stop? He doesn't pray that their suffering and affliction will end? That's what we usually pray for. And, and, and I understand that. Nobody wants anybody to be in pain. I, I get it. But, it's, but when we pray for the pain to stop, and for them to be relieved of the difficulty, are we actually praying against God's plan? I'm just asking. Never once in Paul's letters does he ever pray for God to remove the suffering. He did it for himself three times, and God said no three times, and God said my grace is sufficient for you. My power 
is made perfect, complete in your weakness. He prays that they'll grow through it. He prays for himself. Therefore, I will gladly rejoice in my weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, go read it. He prays that they would see and respond in faith and God would be honored. That they would be judged worthy of the call, his calling. The second thing he prays for is that by God's power, God may fulfill every good purpose in them. The term purpose can be translated resolve. He had resolved that goodness would be one of the things that would mark the lives of his children. That's God's resolve. And he's going to do it. And they may fulfill every resolve for good. Good is such a general word. But in the New Testament, almost always at the root of that word is the idea of generosity. That they may fulfill every resolve for generosity. That they would resolve to be open-handed that they would resolve to be great-hearted. Acts chapter 11, verse 24, there's a mention of a man named Barnabas, who was Paul's um, partner in the first missionary journey. 11.24 of Acts says, He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Good. Generous. He was a generous man. He was great-hearted. By the way, what have you resolved before God? Have you resolved to be generous? Some of you have, and I'll be honest with you, I'm blown away by your generosity, and God is honored by generosity. It was interesting that if you look back and read church history, especially in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. There are a number of men and women who wrote about their resolves. One man said, I resolve to do what is right, even when I'm around those who never do what is right. Wow, what a great word for today. Resolved, I will do what is right, even though I'm surrounded by a culture that is committed to never doing what is right. What resolve have you placed before God and that you have asked him in prayer to help you, empower you to fulfill? And then the third thing he prays for is that his power, God's power and God's might would fulfill every act prompted by your faith. It reminds me of back in the very first letter, what he wrote to them in the first chapter. We continually remember before God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love. There they are right there. And in the second letter, he prays in verse 11, their work of faith would be produced by God's power. Going through difficult times, these believers wanted to be known as people who walk by faith. Even when plunged neck deep into difficulty and affliction and suffering. And the average onlooker would look at them and say, what a shame that they've got to suffer like that. But Paul tells them how great it is. Because they are a force, they are, are forced then to depend upon God, and their faith will be stretched, and their muscles of trust will grow. Let me let me just mention one more thing uh, in verse 11. This idea of your, your act prompted by your faith. 
What's it empowered by? God's power. The term power here is the original word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. We have the dynamite of God working on our side. In the midst of suffering, when we want relief, our Lord wants us to deep wants to deepen our character. When we want out and we want relief from the he wants us to journey through. When we say it's over, God wants to say it worked. Notice the purpose. Verse 12. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. A good synonym for the, the word name is reputation. As the result of you going through what you're going through by faith and trust, with no fear, no anxiety, God's reputation is honored. People will look back and say, wow, the Lord was certainly honored in that. Obviously, his glory was the focus of that action. Now, I know that there are people going through very difficult times, whether it's a job situation or a marriage problem or issues with your kids. Maybe it's physical pain. And you are right next to pitching your tent on the street called Panic Place. And you're just about ready to move in. I want to tell you that the only way you're going to make it through whatever challenge you face right now is to take it to God in prayer. Don't read about it. Don't study about prayer. Just do it. And be specific. I, I laughed at the cartoon about a boy who had been in public school his whole life and he stands up front to give his report on the pilgrims. He said this, the pilgrims came here seeking freedom from you know what, where they landed and when they landed they gave thanks to you know who and because of them we can worship each, each Sunday you know where. <laughs> that's how useless our prayers are sometimes Lord bless the missionaries how about naming one how about picking one to pray for instead of Lord lead God and direct us how about Lord it's your situation and you name it I'm here waiting on you what do you want me to do? How do you want me to proceed? As a result, let me give you four suggestions that'll help you in your intercession with four others, okay? A lot of times we pray, we pray earnestly for ourselves. I'm suggesting that we pray earnestly for other people. Northwest Bible Church is known for that and I, and I want that to not only continue, but I want that to deepen. So let me give you four suggestions. I've already mentioned this, but be specific. Because if you're not specific, how are you going to know when the answer comes? And when you pray for people, follow up with people. Okay? Secondly, read God's power into the situation of others. Look at what they're going through. See God's power on display in their lives. Pray that the power would increase. If you don't see God's power and purpose in another's sufferings, all you'll have is pity on them. All you'll feel is sorry for them. You'll have no depth to read God's solution into their problems. 
Read God's power into the situation of others. Thirdly, reflect on the development of their faith. Don't focus on the pain. See the development of faith. And that will give you peace in the midst of their pain. And pray that they would pray for peace in their situation. Reflect on the development of their faith. And lastly, remember the ultimate goal is God's glory. Not being happy. Not being free of pain. The ultimate goal in this short span of time we call life is God's glory. As we saw last week, we will live eternally. This life is this long. We are to honor God regardless of the situations right now, praying for his power to be evident in people's lives, that they would be respond in faith, their faith would grow, they would mature in Christ, that, we, that they would see God's power in their situations and learn how to be specific in prayer. Now, I have no stick of dynamite to throw in your lap. If I did, as I told you, I would. But aren't you glad I don't? I'm not sure even that would get some people fishing. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this encouragement to be intercessors on behalf of other people in their need. Teach us, Lord, how to pray. Teach us to come into your presence with confidence. Teach us to know that you're involved and that the greatest outcome of difficulty and suffering in our lives is the development of our trust in you, our faith in you, and your glory being revealed to other people who don't know you yet as Lord and Savior. Help us to learn to have an, an open mind to what you are doing in our lives and a willingness to trust you with the specifics. Thank you, Lord, that you are a good God and that although we at times don't see it that way, Lord, may you teach us the value of trusting you and staying connected with you 24-7, 365. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.